Just a stone's throw away from downtown Dallas, Irving, Texas is a community well acquainted with the motion picture industry. In the early 1980s, real estate developer Trammell Crow chose Irving as the site for his Dallas communications complex. Seizing the opportunity which the motion picture complex presented, the city of Irving approved funding for a film commission and began actively courting the film industry and the dollars it could bring to the local economy. Since that time, several well-known Hollywood films have been produced here. Films like Silkwood, Talk Radio, and Born on the Fourth of July. But aside from the high-rolling Hollywood producer who chose Irving as the location, there is another type of filmmaker which frequents the neighborhood. These are the local filmmakers who produce independent features, shorts, and music videos, often on painfully low budgets. This program is about the virtually unknown men and women working in and around Irving, Texas, who have chosen the motion picture as their method of expression. In this and other episodes, filmmakers discuss the rewards and difficulties of working with few resources in a high-cost medium. What's it like to be a struggling filmmaker in Irving, Texas? We will find out on Guerrilla Cinema. People who are doing the kind of film I'm into are doing it because they really, really want it bad. They're ready to do it no matter what the uh, climate, no matter what the environment. They love it enough, and uh, they're going to make it happen because they're exceptionally demented, obsessed people. Film is, is a kind of um, an infection. I think it's a real infection, and there's no cure for it. The compromise, time vis-a-vis -vis money. You don't have time for the close-ups. I directed Mark of the Witch. Um, I produced Horror High. I produced The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Of course, that's really not a Dallas picture, is it? That's that's an American International Hollywood stroke slash Texarkana picture, I suppose, uh, with a lot of Dallas people involved. Tom Moore, a producer and director who has worked in Dallas for more than two decades. He has produced and or directed several feature films and dozens of television commercials. I, I didn't waste time going to school. It was silly to go to school. I barely finished high school. I didn't go to college. I already had a job. But I was, I was from the South, and, 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 uh, and one doesn't just automatically go into the motion picture business if you're from the Deep South. There were no channels at that time, in the, in, the, in the 50s, in the early 50s. I think it's important for a director, to, for his first picture to be a horror picture. I think you learn a lot from it. You get a lot from it, and you, it has a lot of license, and you can do a lot of different things and still stay within the format. You know, it'd be nice to be able to make Batman as your first picture, but you can't really do that, can you? I mean, 
You've only got one of those. There are lots of horror pictures, and so you get you get your turn more quickly. Mm. I enjoy the work. Uh, um, I know what's going to happen. I don't get scared. Um, I'm not sure horror pictures are supposed to scare you. Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, I, 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 suspense pictures I love. Hitchcock. Horror pictures I enjoy. I, I, yeah, I guess I do enjoy seeing them. I don't wallow in them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, not quite like Joe Bob might, but I, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah, but I know what's going to happen. Now, if someone shows me something new, that's kind of that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure I like terror films very much. Uh, terror films do scare me. I, I don't like violence very much. Uh, Toon violence is fine, and horror pictures, the sort of horror, the sort of things we did, it was toon violence. I mean, the uh, you know, the, everybody got up. <laughs> you know, I know Brownie made Brownie Brownrig made some pictures here. And you're going to be talking with him, or you know, I know, uh, where where people didn't get up necessarily. Well, we killed some people in Hara High. We oh, we really did kill some people, didn't we? We were talking about it before. We we, uh, we yeah, we cut off a teacher's head with a paper cutter. That was fun. We stopped uh, stopped the track coach to death with track shoes. That's violent, isn't it? Gee, I guess I I, you know, when I think of violence, I think of it as being real. Uh, when somebody when someone gets hurt, <laughs> if someone gets their head cut off, they're not really hurt, are they? It's kind of tune violence. I don't know. So I accept that. I find a rape scene in a film very difficult to watch. I don't want to watch it. I won't watch it. I don't want to see someone cut up with a razor blade by a sneaky person in an elevator. I, I don't want to see that. That, that does not entertain me but sneaking around a dark corner where a paper cutter might be and the music's going da, 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 da. I like that, yeah. That's fun. That's tune violence, if there is such a thing. We could coin that phrase, couldn't we? Tune violence. Uh, they get up and, and they do it again. The, uh, if a refrigerator falls on them, it's okay. Uh, it just kind of makes them flat a little bit. You know? Then they get up and take two. <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, yeah, I can watch horror pictures. Yeah, I like them. I think probably the finest American film. Uh, thank goodness for the rental, the rental places now where we can go and see these, all of these wonderful films that we, we, we couldn't get our hands on before, the foreign pictures, which I do wallow in. I watch four or five a weekend sometimes. I've seen every foreign picture Blockbuster offers. Um, I'm starting on other rental stores that may have something, something new and different. Um, I watch them by countries. I'll have a Japanese month, or, or well, Japanese week. It doesn't take a month to see all the Japanese pictures. Um, an Israeli uh, weekend, uh, a French month, uh, an Italian year. Uh, I love French pictures. I love Italian pictures. I like American pictures, but we've made, we haven't made. We haven't made the kind that I like uh, until uh, again until just recently. Um, I think I think the finest American film is The Godfather. Uh, both films together, the work, The Godfather. So Francis Ford Coppola, I believe, is probably one of our finest filmmakers. I enjoy the comic book films very much. Steven Spielberg's uh, uh, things that he's done and. And uh, uh, and Lucas and, and the wonderful things they're doing, uh, the revitalization into American film is just, of course, it's, it's storybook now. It's, it's 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 so important. But my favorite filmmakers, I like very complicated love stories, so I like Claude Lelouch very much. Uh, I love the way he can inter intertwine stories and weave them around to where you're not sure who's who and what's going to happen next. Of course, the French filmmakers, uh, Barry, uh, Jean de Florette and Manion of the Spring, 
these are these are wonderful pictures. Uh, uh, the Italians, I I, uh, I still love Federico Fellini, of course. Uh, and the, the wonderful surreal things that he did with film. So uh, I, my my film lights are very eclectic. We asked Mr. Moore what was the biggest drawback in directing a low-budget feature. Mm, the compromise. The compromise, time vis-a-vis -vis money. Um, you don't have time for the close-ups. And if you really are a director and you really do care about, care about the story. Well, I used to do an interesting thing when I'd go on location. I would... Uh, when I would check into the motel or hotel, wherever we were going to be staying for our picture, if I were the producer, and I, and, I, and I would call the maid from my floor there, if we were going to be there for sometimes four months. I, I made a picture in, in Florida, five months, uh, the Norrisman, and we were in Tampa for, for almost five months, a long time. And I, I, I write on my mirror in, in, in the bathroom of the hotel, this message to myself, so I see it first thing every morning. If I'm the producer, I take this pen tell or marks a lot, and I mark on there, you are the producer. Make it possible for the director to tell the story. And I see that first thing every morning. On pictures that I directed, I would write on my bathroom mirror, you are the director. Tell the story! Exclamation point. Well, if you want to tell the story, if you feel you understand the characters, and if there's a story, indeed a story to tell, even if it's a silly story, like a bunch of kids getting together in the professor's house to call back a witch, it's still, it's a film. It, 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 it's, you're, you, have, you have responsibility to the film. And as a filmmaker, you have responsibility to, to use the tools of the trade to tell that story. That is, you introduce a situation, and then you show close-ups. That's what you missed in the low-budget film. The close-ups. They're not, there's no time. There's no time to improvise that, that other little shot that you've discovered while you're making the master shot. You say, oh, golly, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we could just take the camera, put it up here, and have it move around here and, and come back in because that business you just did was wonderful. Oh, that was great. You did that real well, Fatine. Uh, and then someone says, but we don't have time for that. I'll have to get the dolly track from there. I'll have to relight this. We'll have to change the key to over here. We'll have to gel those windows because we always film on location. It's cheaper. We use real places. And then all of a sudden the sadness comes over you and you say, well, I'll remember I wanted to do that shot. So you sit and you watch these pictures and you say, there's where I wanted to do the shot from the staircase. There's where we wanted to do the unmanned cameras, the car chase ran over it. There's where we wanted to do this. So I see these pictures, you asked me earlier, do I enjoy seeing horror pictures? Usually that is to say, do I enjoy seeing low budget pictures? I think probably one of the reasons that I don't enjoy them as much as, as other people, possibly, is the fact that I feel for the director and for the filmmakers there and say, I know that they didn't want that reflector to move from the wind in that shot, but they couldn't do another shot. Uh, I'm told people like Spielberg storyboard every little thing. They think that adds a prompt. Wonderful. <laughs> It'd be nice to have $40 million. Yeah, then you could think about your two ants on your lamb up front. You wouldn't have to worry about it with a second unit, probably. But all of that's out the window when you're making your first picture. You don't know about the pad. You don't know about the dialogue with the editor. You don't know about anything. You don't know what you're doing. You're making a movie. <laughs> We're making a movie. That's the reward in itself. You're making the movie. It's what you've always wanted to do. Doesn't mean you know how to do it. So you do the best you can. Now that's an ingredient you're seeing when you watch horror pictures and first time horror pictures. Not not after a guy has decided like Corman or someone like that 
<clears throat> who makes a living doing it. Uh, there's nothing fresh there. He's that's deliberate. Boom, 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 boom. You know, kill that one. <laughs> Blow up that outfit. <laughs> you know, we we're going around saying whose fingers can we cut off next? <laughs> you know, because it was fun. Once we found if we found a prop that worked, we had to use it twice, three times. The finger scene at work. We cut off her fingers at the school and it worked. Oh, good. What do we do? Let's cut her head off. Oh, okay. <laughs> you see, when you make your first picture, your, your slip is showing. Whether you want it to or not, whether you, whether you know it is or not, it is. It is. And, and there are flaws. The flaws are always in, in, in tying the story together and keeping the pace and the thing going. Uh, I don't know how it would have been different. I, I suppose I, I think that you might be stuck with that. Like if your first picture was a horror picture and you made it, say, for American International, or you made it for whomever, and it was going to go to Sam Markoff at American International Pictures back and be released, and it was a success, they'd make you an offer you couldn't refuse to make another, and another, and another, and another. You would never make your love story. Of course, I haven't made mine either, have I? I did recently rent and watch The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which was based on a true story. Uh, I produced that picture. Charles, it was a Charles Pierce production, and Charlie directed it. I was, I was his associate producer. Charles produces, writes, and directs, and stars, and everything he does. Uh, but, but he has people around him who have lesser titles who do all the work. Not true. He's a hard-working filmmaker. Uh, anyway, that picture is fun to watch. It holds up well. Um, it's based on a true story uh, about a, a phantom killer in Texarkana, and it involved Lone Wolf Gonzalez, Texas Ranger, uh, who lived in Dallas, and I think just passed away a few years ago. He retired here. It was an old man. Uh, when when uh, Charlie spoke with him before we made the picture, his part was played by Ben Johnson in the film. Um, but but we that picture has some silly parts in it that Charlie wanted to do for comic relief, and and it was that was part of what one did in driving pictures at that time. So it was very apropos, and it was fun. Uh, and now it's a little bit silly, uh, having it's got a sort of a Barney Fife character in it, which Charlie does play himself. Uh, but it's good for comic relief because it was really the murders were dreadful things. But we played it uh, as, as a very camp old thing. We, we spent a lot of time getting uh, cars uh, and, and uh, fixing the car uh, uh, proper cars for the era. We were very meticulous in the costume and the wardrobe. Uh, we took the old train station in downtown Texas County and completely renovated it and put it back to where it was in 1947. Um, with the little uh, vending kiosks and things like that, that that were a part of that period of time. So the picture is very watchable, uh, and I, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, Dawn Wells is in it. I made uh, four pictures with Dawn. She's one of my favorite people. She was Mary Ann on Gilligan's Island, and uh, uh, she's in that picture, and I does a very heavy duty dramatic role, and, she, and she's quite good. Uh, but it holds up. I think Mark of the Witch would hold up. If, if it, I don't know why it's not in distribution. Come to think of it, it's better than a lot of things that I've seen. Um, there are one or two other pictures that I've made that probably shouldn't be in <laughs> distribution, but uh, Mark of the Witch could be. I think so. We praise the Odin. You've allowed Bijan to die, as only a Norseman should ever die. Sea to Valhalla, for he had died with his sword in his hand.
hand. The last picture that I made was the Norseman uh, with Lee Majors and uh, Cornell Wilde and Chris Connolly and lots of people. Um, that was 1978. In 1979, I, uh, I was one of three people who started Spindletop Productions. And Spindletop uh, manufactured television commercials. And uh, we, we never made any pictures. So I've been out of, for a decade, for a full, for a full 10 years, I've, I've been out of any contact with making pictures. Now I'm no longer connected with uh, Spindletop. I, uh, I, uh, as a matter of fact, have been have been doing some writing, and I have a script uh, uh, th that I've written uh, based on a series of short stories I've been working on uh, that uh, is being being looked at by Ron Howard Productions, and uh, uh, something else is being looked at by uh, by Ted Turner, uh, the Family Channel Network. I am directing the uh, Joe Bob Briggs show for the Movie Channel. Now, uh, which gives me uh, keeps me in contact with with driving movies uh, uh, vicariously through uh, Joe Bob, uh, and it's a lot of fun to reminisce uh, about some of the some of the pictures I've I've seen. He certainly has seen a lot more of those pictures than I have. He's seen them all, everyone ever made. He really has. Um, but uh, I do that, and I make TV commercials, and I'm a fan, and I go see pictures, and I'm waiting to make my love story. I don't know. I've never been able to figure the trends in filmmaking. Therein lies the secret to one's success. All films are good. All films have some redeeming value. The success or failure of that film is fate, is the luck of the draw is when it was put out. There was a time where there was one year when there were no G-rated pictures. And I decided I'm going to make one. Truly as a commercial venture. And we made Return to Boggy Creek. Right here. What'd you see, Tea Fish? With something like this? You saw the monster? You really saw it? And it was good. It's a good little kid's picture. I made it for five year olds. I was stupid. Five year olds can't go to the movies. Their mommies have to take them. You've got to make something that will hit a time when when adults will have some interest in it. You can't make a movie for five-year-old kids. They don't have any money. They don't have a car. And their mommy won't let them cross the street so they can't go to the movies. So if you're going to make those kinds of pictures, you have to make them for television. That's where the five-year-old can turn on and, and watch but the year that I made that picture, we thought, this will work. And we opened, we bought 100 release prints. It's a lot for a low budget picture. 
And there were nine G-rated pictures came out that year, that summer. The big, the big, the big opening date then was June second. That's the weekend after school's out. Kids got nothing to do. That's the big hit for all the G-rated pictures, all the PGs. I'm not sure when the release dates are now. That was a decade ago. But on June second, we decided to get the jump a week. So we went back into May, and we opened. Good business. We opened 54 theaters in Houston. We opened, I'm sorry, we opened 80 theaters in the Houston umbrella. We opened 54 theaters in the Dallas umbrella the following weekend. Did good business in both towns. Then motion picture history was made. On June the 2nd, a picture called Star Wars came out. And all of the pictures died. There was our picture that was doing well in our own little territory, and we were ready to branch out. We had lots of bookings all over the country. Joe Camp released For the Love of Benji, which is the one that he made in, uh, in Greece, I believe. John, Way uh, John Wayne's son, Pat, Pat Wayne, made Eye of the Tiger. Walt Disney had some kind of a fluffy dog, giant fluffy dog picture. And I don't recall the others, but there were like nine G-rated pictures that came out that year. Because everyone had seen that gap. And all the distributors had said, give us G-rated product. So we all went out and made these things. Nobody told us about this guy named Lucas, really. We didn't know what it was. Then Star Wars hit. Star Wars was a motion picture experience. Not only was the picture superb, our pictures were not were nothing in comparison with that film, obviously, but but it was an experience. Yeah, if you recall, the theaters were open 24 hours a day to take care of the crowd. You had to stand in line one day for the ticket, go see the picture at two o'clock in the morning the next day. That's a motion picture experience. You're through with movies for two or three weeks after that. It's like if you went to Woodstock to, to the concert. Well, you're not going to take off the next week and go to a rock and roll concert in another field somewhere, right? You're through with movies for a week. That was your movie, movie, motion picture going experience. And you experienced it, and it's over. Well, the little pictures like we made die on the vine in one week. If you're not held over on Tuesday, it's over. And if it's over, then all those other bookings that you had were just penciled on a piece of paper, and they're canceled. So this happened to every one of those pictures. I later met Patrick Wayne and talked to him about it, and we, we were comparing notes about this. And Joe Camp and I have talked about it in, recent, in, in, in past years. It was absolutely, it killed, killed them all. Now, will there ever be a market for them again? I bet there will be. I'll bet there'll even be a four-wall market again where a filmmaker will make a modest little film with a lot of love and a lot of care and a lot of fun and it'll play somewhere and he'll say, that was my picture. And he will have, he will have had his dream come true. And that's really what it's all about. Yeah, as Joe Bob would say, the drive-in will never die. It probably will.